You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network, the home of the Options Podcast. For more quality options programs, visit theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app available in the iTunes and Google Play stores. Select programs are also available via live stream at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com slash options dash insider. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at Twitter.com slash options, StockTwits.com slash options, Facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the options insider.com. And now, it's time for the show that breaks down the options market from unusual activity alerts to market analysis, strategy overviews, listener questions, and much more. If it involves puts and calls, then our all-star panel will break it down. It's time to hit the option block with your host, Mark Longo from the Options Insider Media Group and co-hosts. Uncle Mike Tussaw from St. Charles Wealth Management, along with Mark the Greasy Meatball Sebastian and Andrew the Rock Lobster Joe Venazzi from OptionPit.com. And now, get ready to hit the Option Block. All right, everybody. That rocking tune can mean only one thing. It is time for the Thursday edition of the old OB, a.k.a. the Option Block, my name is Mark Longo. I'll be your guide here for this one-hour journey. Not quite three hours like Gilligan. Going to go only one hour. Have a little bit more later, though, on Twifo, so stay tuned if you want a little more in your ear holes. And, of course, if you like what you hear, this show, Twifo, Advisors Option, whatever show floats your boat, Options Boot Camp, Options Playbook Radio, all of the above and much more. Make sure you leave those reviews on your platform of choice so new folks can continue to discover our network in these troubled times out there. Love seeing new folks and new ear holes tuning in all the time. So if you want to do your part, if you like what you hear, keep those reviews coming. It's pretty simple. It's pretty easy. We don't ask for much. <laughs> it helps new folks continue to discover our content all these many years after launch. Of course, keep those questions coming, too. Particularly on a day like today, we're going to open up the old mail block. It's nice to hear from you folks. See what you have on your twisted brains. Let's see who else is joining us to vent their twisted brains. When I think of twisted brains... I got to start in the hinterlands of these fine United States, where I'm joined once again by the rockingest of lobsters, Mr. Andrew Giovinazzi from OptionPit.com by way of Carmen Lion Capital. Mr. I almost said meatball. I apologize. Mr. Rock Lobster, <laughs> welcome back to the program. A, and how are things in the land of the pit? How'd your big uh, Little John Robin Hood thing go yesterday? Um, the meatball did quite well. Um, we're off to our first, uh, our, we're off to the first. Uh, um, uh, trade and actually it's up some money, which is good. Um, nice to get out of the gate, uh, kind of on the right foot. Um, really great. So as, again, looking at information and then using some of our proprietary technology to find, uh, the best risk reward option to purchase. So, so far, uh, so good. And, uh, so anyway, proud of Mark, you did a nice job. And, uh, and let, let's just say little John is off and running into the Sherwood Forest. The Sherwood Forest of options, we'll call it. <laughs> the Sherwood options, Forest of options. Sherwood Forest. As I told Mark earlier this week, I'm more of a fan of Friar Tuck, but hey, to each their own. I'm sure there's some Maid Marian fans out there. If this branding is successful, I'm sure we'll see all of them make appearances <laughs> in the land of the pit. And also joining us, I don't think he has any Robin Hood-oriented branding. Maybe we'll see. Let's find out. He is the uncleest of Mike's, Mr. Mike Tussaw from St. Charles Wealth Management. Uncle Mike, welcome back to the program. A and B, do you have any kind of robber of the rich give to the poor themed branding, sir? No, I'll be honest. I, Robin Hood's a thief, if you ask me. Uh, that's all he is. When you rob, you're a thief. Um, I'm all for helping the poor, but I don't believe in robbing. Uh, but with that, my one connection is that my grandma and grandpa, before they passed away, when they lived in Winston-Salem, North Carolina, uh, they lived on Friar Tuck Road. See, another vote for Friar Tuck. I knew I liked you, sir, as we head right on into the trading block. 
It's time to break down the latest topics, trades, and trends in the world of options. It's time for The Trading Block. All right, welcome to The Trading Block, the portion of the show we break down what the heck is trading. We also discuss the Merry Men in great detail. Wasn't there a Will Scarlet? Um, they're all coming back to me now in a flash. There were quite a few Merry Men along the way. How merry can you be if you're living in a forest all day, really? But hey, I digress. Coming into showtime today, we're seeing... A little bit of a weird mixed market. It seemed like most of the major markets were going to ease off today. Most of them were slightly in the red not that long before showtime. And now as the show has commenced, we're seeing a couple of them ticking into the green. The Dow up about, actually Dow and S&P up pretty much equal percentages. Both of them up about a third of a percent out there. NASDAQ still the laggard, but only ever so slightly. It's effectively unched now, but ticking a little bit into the red. So apparently all the red that was on the screen earlier this morning, maybe that will be gone even. Actually, NASDAQ just ticked positive. So there we go. (laughs) So all of that concern this morning is now a distant memory. Of course, a lot of a lot of what was weighing on the markets today was coming out of the uh, initial unemployment claims. Uh, the benefits, they fell to 787000 I should say, last week. That's the lowest we've seen uh, since April. People had forecast a decline to eight hundred sixty. You know how I feel about economists and their forecasts, but that's what they were weighing on out there. Of course, there's a lot of voodoo with these numbers this time. California, for example, wasn't reporting recently. They had to actually suspend new applications because their system has such a backlog. So they were completely out of the numbers for a while there. Now they're finally back in. Uh, That's one of the reasons why we have the number that we have today. Uh, So a lot of weird voodoo going on with these numbers out there. Coming into today's show, we saw not a lot of voodoo on the vol side of the screen as well. Not surprising. The markets were kind of unched coming into showtime. We're seeing VIX a few minutes ago was at about 28 and a quarter as we kicked off the show. That puts it up slightly, up about half a handle from our last show on Monday. Our old friend VVIX still staying pretty frothy, shy of that 120 level now, down to about 115. That puts it down a little over a handle from our last show, about one and a half handles from the last show. And our old friend VXX coming to showtime was pretty much unched. It was still at 22 and a quarter, so... No juicy erosion for all you VXX faders out there. Old friend VolQ out there as well, which is, of course, the -the at-the-money volatility of the NASDAQ 100. Remember, no skew for you. At the money, just the facts, ma'am, out there. That was literally on coming into showtime as well. It had been up slightly earlier in the day, up about a third of a point, but coming into showtime, it had given all that back as well. It was pretty much at a 32 half, which was exactly where it was on Monday when we dove into it with Mr. Rhodes. So a whole heck of a lot and nothing On the screens, at least today, of course, we have later on today, we have a bunch of earnings. Earnings have been popping off all week. We'll get to some of those in a minute. We got a whole rash of hot and fresh earnings move, earnings move result, and earnings season reports for you guys. Hot off the presses from our friends over there in Orash land. You know where to go to find it all. Theoptionsinsider.com is the place to go. You can't beat the price. It's all free. Of course, people waiting for the big debates tonight as well. Rumors are they're going to mute the mics when people aren't speaking. That might be interesting. We'll see how the candidates react to that. Should be, should be an interesting one at the very least. Maybe a little bit more intelligible than the last one, hopefully. All right, let's go around the horn. Let's start in the land of Uncle Mike's, who also enjoys a good fire tuck every now and then. Mr. Uncle Mike, sir, what is on your radar today? And what is turning out to be perhaps an Uncle Mike kind of day? Yeah, we'll have to wait and see along those lines. Uh, in terms of the debates, I don't think the mute button is necessarily the the way with which to go with it. Uh, unfortunately, he passed away, but I'm, I said it a couple of weeks ago, and I'll say it again. You get me and Gene Okerlund to be the moderator of the debate. Uh, there would be that would be perfect. He could handle both of those guys, and he would have no problem with either of them. Mean Gene would would, would have been a perfect moderator. If he could handle Warrior and Hogan and those guys, yeah, Trump and Biden will be piece of cake. Totally, not even a problem. Not even a problem. Uh, but getting into the market, I think it feels like today we're looking at the market just as kind of waiting out uh, and seeing what's going to happen tonight with the debates, uh, whether or not we have more certainty. I think the big fear right now, it feels like the market is predicting a Biden victory, uh, but. We don't know because uh, we were on this show four years ago all thinking that Hillary Clinton was going to win. And so we'll see. 
Uh, I'm actually, I've actually never looked forward to doing a show on the Options Insider Network more than I am doing our election night special. I can't wait to be on that. It's going to be a lot of fun, with, uh, regardless of what happens or who the, who the winner is in the election. Uh, but with what's happening in the marketplace today, uh, we have actually rallied a little bit since the show started. Not a whole heck of a lot. I think we're up roughly just under a half a percent in the S&P 500 right now. Um, uh, but not a lot uh, with it. I think that uh, we we are very much in a macro news environment in the stock market. And so until we have some more macro news, I'm not necessarily seeing a lot of things happening. Uh, COVID seems to really not be much of an issue with the market yet again. I know out here in Kane County, uh, they're talking about uh, bringing some more shutdowns into place and doing some things. There's restaurants in Kane County saying how they, they aren't going to follow it because they legally can't do it and people come anyway. Uh, but market doesn't seem to care about things like that because I know we're not the only county doing it. I know in California I'd heard recently uh, that they're going to limit uh, people going to family parties and private homes. Uh, there's going to be a lot more restrictions going on from what it sounds like. But at least for now, we're roughly a few percentage points away from all-time highs in the S&P 500, and the market, once again, doesn't really seem to care about such a thing. Uh, in terms of some movers and shakers, uh, silver is down a little bit today. We keep hovering around in, in the low 20 levels with silver. I think that uh, silver could be a big player going into this election. Uh, if it does come out to be some type of uncertainty, I could see silver making a big run to the upside. And then, of course, we have VIX. Excited to hear Andrew's take on the VIX here in a little bit and the high 20s as well. And uh, I think overall in this marketplace, this is one of the times to where uh, we have high stocks and high volatility, relatively speaking. And so I really like doing more premium selling strategies right now uh, or premium buying sell strategies along with a lot of premium selling mixed in. Uh, keep in mind, you need to manage your risk accordingly. Uh, and you can do that by using spreads. You can do that by uh, having really tight stop losses in place, whatever way you want to do it. But I think that just with the higher implied volatility that we have in general, premium selling makes a lot more sense in this marketplace. You can be a premium seller and still be bullish, uh, Lord knows I am right now. And uh, that is my take as to what's going on right now. Thank you for that, Mr. Uncleist of Mike's. Now we turn our attention back to the hinterlands, the fog-shrouded shores of Maine, where the clam pirates lurk and the rock lobster watches some volatility. Once in a while, you can get a glimpse through the fog of everyone's favorite stick figure, Mr. Ballman. Mr. Rock Lobster, sir, what is on your radar and perhaps the radar of our old friend Ballman these days? Well, you know, I, I kind of say this in and out, but I think at least for now, I, the vol trade looks kind of dead. I, I have very little on vol product wise. It's just so where is vol going to go before the election? Um, I don't know. <laughs> it, it seems to have pinned to like about a 29 vol. And I said on this show a couple of times, like the market's trying to handicap the straddle. Um, and also we're starting to shift past the election. So VIX is now looking past the election. So looking kind of on the, just at the, just at the vol, uh, right at it's starting to move away. Uh, I think it actually is according to VIX, it's past. So from a vol point of view, I think vol land is relatively uninteresting unless two major things happen. Uh, there's a vaccine that works prior to the election. This is again, moving the vol, um, I think a stimulus deal is, uh, and that's where the market's kind of lackadaisical, uh, on again, off again. I, I don't think it's going to happen, to be honest, uh, before the election. And uh, and as far as corporate earnings go, something to move stocks. There, there has been some decent earnings uh, on mostly social media, but on most stocks, you know, like Wells Fargo had a terrible time. I, I know that seems to be a bank that just keeps kicking itself in the head. Um, but, uh, and Netflix wasn't great, um, as well. So, but it hasn't done much to the stocks. So, I mean, Netflix is down from a pretty <laughs> high price. Um, you're not like, like, so like, so again, what's a catalyst to go higher? So I, to be honest, I like Tucson's idea. I've been selling some puts, put spreads and a lot of drug stocks. A lot of them are just at really low prices. I'm assuming because, 
uh, you know, the market thinks when, you know, Biden wins, uh, drug prices will be some sort of drug price controls or something. That's the only thing I can think of because they're they're trading at pretty low values, um, low levels. Uh, Gilead, it's a stock I follow, um, it is at a five year low, <laughs> you know. It's sitting on $15 a share in cash, but it doesn't seem to matter right now. So um, I think there's some opportunities in the market. Again, just like S2 said, you got to be careful. Uh, but it's mostly on the premium selling side and just expecting to take some stock at some price, you know, moving into, you know, November, December. I don't know what how much of a vol trade there is. Um, I tried to do some prognosticating for how low VXX can go. If the election goes smoothly, maybe 18, 18 or 17, um, if we can get to uh, like a 23 or 24 November future, um, which is quite a bit lower than it is now. It's trading around 28 or 29, I believe. So it can easily get to that level. Um, it has not. It, ha it has a ha the near term future has had a very hard time staying below a 25 or a 24 uh, for the last six months. So, like I said, I think COVID still reigns supreme. The fact that politicians continue to think about these lockdowns, which I personally, I am not for. I don't see how they've really helped, especially if you look at what's happening in Europe. It hasn't really helped them much. It, it would be nice if we heard more of an embrace of common sense from the White House, I think, about, uh, uh, you know, a mass and social distancing and washing your hands. And, like, just everybody's got to keep doing that until there's a vaccine, I guess. Just that's kind of the way it is, or we're just going to have a lot of cases. Um, I don't... I don't see how you can look at what's going on and say how oh, that's not going to happen. So I think the market weighs those things um, like it's bad, but it's not catastrophic yet. Um, but if we do lockdown again, I don't I don't think the market is seeing lockdown. So that would be a pretty big surprise if they actually started pushing forward with it pretty hard. Um, I don't think that's priced in, to be honest. Um so I think that would be the surprise. Um, and it would be a big negative surprise, in my opinion. So um, I, I just think that's where we're, we're, just, we're sort of stuck here. We're going to be stuck till November 3rd. Um, we'll see how the debate goes tonight. But, you know, uh, <laughs> I don't see the president changing his uh, stripes very much. It would be quite a surprise. So uh, <laughs> the outcome will probably be a lot like the last one. So. Anyway, that's, again, 100% guess, but we'll see what happens with all that. We shall see indeed, sir. Now let's see what's going on in these crazy markets we got going on today. Coming into, actually, just as of a few minutes ago, let's crunch the numbers for the big indices first. VIX actually doing some paper at about 280,000 contracts uh, as of a couple of minutes ago here. The ADB out there also ticking up. Remember, it was starting to threaten 300K not too long ago. Those are you know, late summer, dog days of August kind of numbers out there. Now we're back up to a little bit more respectable. 402,000 out there right now. SPY at about 1.8 million. It's right around half of its ADV, which is pretty close to 4 million out there as well. The S looking pretty light right now at about 389,000 contracts. The ADV just dipped back below 1 million. It's at about 997,000 again. So maybe the S trending in the wrong direction. We'll see. The Q is looking pretty active, though. 550,000 contracts on the tape. ADV right around a million as well, so a little bit north of half of their ADV out there as well. Let's go on out see what the most active equity options are out there today. The individual names you guys love to sling so much. Looks like a lot of names you guys like to sling in the top 10 yet again today. Number 10, Amazon. Cost you 189000 to break into the top 10 today. I get you all the way to the Amazonians here at number 10. Number 9, Apache, ticker symbol APA, back in the top 10, 196000 Then we jump up over two hundred k already by number 8. That gets us to Bank of America, 214,000 contracts. Number 7, a little name you guys may have heard of called Facebook, 219,000 contracts. Number 6, what the old school guys used to call telephone. Guys who were old when I walked on the floor at SIPO used to call it that. Back when having a telephone, I guess, was a big deal. I never understood why telephone was an abbreviation for the ticker T. That seems way, way longer to me. Much more work. But hey, who am I to judge? AT&T out there. These, plus, calling it telephone is so dated now. I mean, they, they do a few other things out there. But let's go with the old school telephone for number six, 246,000 contracts. Number five, Neo, still in the top ten. 
262,000 contracts. Number four, GE also remaining stubbornly in the top 10 these days, 318,000. Number three, Snap. Once again, out there, 413,000. I guess you probably can guess what number two and number one are. They're neck and neck with each other right now. Tesla, number two, 915,000 contracts. That means number one with a bullet, but not quite a million contracts, is Apple, 959,000 contracts. Since we're talking Tesla and all that fun stuff, let's get into it. Hot and heavy week out there on the earnings season. If you like options, if you like equity options, if you like volatility, then you had to be paying attention to something. Out there this week it was a pretty hot week. Let's just get some of the highlights. Remember, you guys can read all these tickers and a whole bunch more over there. Theoptionsinsider.com. Monday, we had IBM. Tuesday, P&G. And the old Widowmaker, Netflix. Apparently, go figure. They can't keep printing new subscribers forever. Eventually, it's got to be some sort of plateau. Maybe Netflix coming in on that on their recent number. Snap, as well as Albertsons and old school Philip Morris. Wednesday, we had Abbott Labs, Verizon, NASDAQ. The aforementioned Tesla, Chipotle, uh, Discover Card, and Baker Hughes out there on the oil side of the space. Thursday, Coca-Cola. That was today, of course, uh, the old telephone, the aforementioned telephone. American Airlines, Southwest Airlines, Intel, my old stomping ground, Sam Adams, Capital One, Mattel out there in the toy landscape. Let's see how Barbie and others are doing out there. Dow, Sirius XM. Tomorrow we got American Express. Let's pop off a few of these hot off the presses for this morning's results. We've got... Good old telephone. They were at 2672 going into their announcement. They popped off before the bell this morning. The market was pricing in about 3.7%. And as of this report, they had moved about 5.5%. So one of the few names out there that is bucking the crush all vol trend every earnings cycle, getting a little bit more juice in there. We'll see how long that could last. Probably not too long if past is prologue out there. Southwest Airlines also on the docket this morning. They were at 3984 going into their announcement. They were pricing in 6.3%, and they delivered 3.5%. This is more in lines of what I'm looking to see this season, because that's what we've seen for the last couple of cycles, just the complete annihilation of volatility. <laughs> if you're buying vol, get rid of it as quickly as you can out there, at least from an earnings front. Uh, here we go. Let's go to the big dogs out here. Tesla, they were popping off yesterday after the bell. They went into their announcement, 422.64. They were pricing in, oh, let's see, 7.5%. So they were pricing in some juice, some juicy juice, I think, to use the technical term out there. What did they deliver, at least as of this report? They were at 430, so they, were, they had delivered, oh, a whopping 1.7%. So this is pretty much what we've been seeing, what we've been expecting. They're actually up a little bit more today. They're up to 432 and a half. So you get a little bit more juice out there, but still nowhere near the 7. That's, that's a... That's a good amount they were pricing in there, 7.5%. And we didn't see that. Even though the numbers on the revenue side and everything else, people were liking those out there. American Airlines, they were before the bell this morning as well. They went to their announcement, 1274. They were pricing in 5.5%. That seems kind of rich for the airlines. And looks like, at least in the early blush of this report, it was very rich. They had delivered not even a full percent, 0.8%. So premium buyer is getting annihilated out there in American Airlines and not doing too well in Tesla either. Let's look at a few more really quickly because there's a lot of big names that are popping off very soon, including after the bell today, my old buddies, my old stomping ground, Intel. Ah, the stories I could tell you about Intel out there. Coming into today's report, they were at 53 and a half at the time of this report. They were pricing in $3.51, or not percents anymore. The after the results reports are in percent. The pre-earnings reports, the move reports, are in dollar terms. So bear that in mind, looking at these reports. $2.93 is what they're pricing in. In the past, they've moved three fifty one. So maybe the folks in Intel have learned a little bit from the previous seasons and want to get the heck out of the way of that vol annihilation freight train. Good old softy, a perennial top tenor these days. They're popping off on the 27th. They were at 214, almost 215 as of this report. They were pricing in $8.70. In the past, they moved 571. Uh oh. We know that's a recipe for disaster these days. We'll see if Microsoft can deliver that or not. Our friends across the street, maybe the rumors of the return of their barbecue will keep these numbers alive. They were at 163.86. They were pricing in $4.42. In the past, they moved 480. So a little light. Probably a safe way to go this season. Let's do a couple more. Some fruit company I've never heard of. A pool, I believe they're referred to. They're popping off on the 29th. They were at 116.87 as of this report in the past. 
They've moved 524, and they're pricing in 597 right now. So that seems to be in the wrong direction, but Apple tends to do its own thing. But if it can merit that amount of all, we shall see. Also on the 29th, we got the old Amazonians at a whopping $3,184.94 as of this report. They were pricing in $192 pretty much even. And in the past, they moved to buck fifty two, pretty much even. So a lot of extra juice in them thar hills of Amazon. A couple of extras really quick. Facebook, 278.73. They're also on the 29th next week. So a hot day next Thursday on the show. Stay tuned for that. We're pricing in $16, pretty much even, a $16.10 or so. And in the past, they've moved $17.61. So a little light on Facebook front. And let's go to the Googs to wrap it up. Let's go to the Goog L, a.k.a. the Alphabet. They're at $15.51. They were pricing in $72.89. In the past, they've moved about $71. So not a lot of voodoo in there. Pretty much exactly in line over there in Google and Alphabet land. We'll see how this Latest developments from Congress and perhaps these antitrust investigations. Maybe that'll throw a little bit extra wrench into the works there, for at least for the guidance. Obviously not for the previous quarter, but maybe for the guidance going forward. Could make things a little bit interesting. Oh, I lied. One more. Let's go to Twitter. That's also on the 29th. Big day next Thursday, listeners. Uh, $50 and a quarter as of this report. They were pricing in $4.50. In the past, they've moved a whopping six thirty two. So the folks at Twitter out there are getting the message. Less vol, not more. So we'll see if that saves our earnings season. We'll keep an eye on all these names and a whole bunch more because there's a whole bunch popping off in the coming weeks, listeners. And now we've got to keep on rolling. Let's see how some of our previous unusual trades fared. It is time for the Odd Block. It's time to break down the most interesting, unusual, and downright questionable options activity that's been identified by TheOptionsInsider.com. It's time for The Odd Block. All right, everybody, welcome to The Odd Block. Time to get weird, time to get wild, time to get whimsical. Time to also look back and perhaps see how some of these trades we analyzed in the past and looked at and marked to be watched, how they feared. Mr. Rock Lobster, I know you have requested such a thing. What do you think? Should we kick off, sir, looking back at some at a trade or two here? I think we should kick it off to give, to give people a little taste to see if uh, there's something to all this, this odd block stuff. I, what, <laughs> what do you say? I know you love your line in the sand puts, but we can't do only line in the sand puts. We have profiled a few, ah. a few other trades. Spoiler alert. Those line of sand puts seem to have all worked out pretty well so far. <laughs> that's, uh, that's kind of the narrative. There's two narratives to this year so far. On the earnings front, don't touch any vol. And on the uh, single name kind of individual trade front, write them line of the sand puts. And it's working out so far. Let's see, Mr. Rock Lobster, if buying some calls can also work out. We're flipping the script. We're going back, setting the dial on the Wayback Machine. Not that far, actually. Back to October 8th on the program. You may recall, listeners, we profiled some upside call love in Marvell Technology Group. No, this is the one we joked about Iron Man. No, this is not, not the Iron Man calls, even though that would be pretty cool. <laughs> we all agreed on that on the show. Now, this is Marvell Technology Group, of course, ticker symbol MRVL. And at the time, you profiled 13,626 of the OC 45 calls going up for 58 cents. They lifted that offer nearly 14,000 times. They wanted to get themselves some call action in Marvell. At the time this print went up, the stock was $43.14. We'll get to where it is right now in a second. It's a bit of a spoiler. And this is one of those trades, Mr. Rocklops. We always talk about this. I always use the analogy here of, you know, you get a, let's say you set up a week long trade or trade, week long trip. To Vegas. I don't know why you go for that long. I'm not a huge Vegas guy. I'm more of a couple of days in and out. Let's say you set up a big trip to Vegas when we can do those things again. We didn't go places. Uh, Let's fast forward to then. You go to Vegas. You got this whole thing planned out. Week long extravaganza. You're going to do this. You're going to that. You land. Maybe you walk into the hotel and just for fun, you throw a bet down on the roulette table and you hit it big or maybe you do crap. Whatever your game of choice is, you pull a hand on the slot machine. Let's say you walk in the door before you even check into your hotel. You win like 10 grand or 20 grand, whatever the case may be. You win a bunch of cash. Uh, That's kind of what happened to our friend here. (laughs) Now you're in that weird kind of, what do I do? Do I 
turn around and walk out because the smart play is to take that money and get the hell out of Dodge because you know if you're there, you're going to give it all back and you end up staying there the whole week anyway because you already got the trip and you give away that 20 grand and a whole bunch more over the course of the week. That's kind of what happened to our friend here because literally the next day after we profiled this trade, remember he bought the Oct 45s listeners for 58 cents, the stock shot up to almost a 55 strike. The next day, it got up to 44.70 very quickly, so up well over a dollar just in the next session. So this guy was looked like he was hitting a home run. He was up quite a bit on those calls. They closed the next session. They traded higher, I'm sure, intraday. They closed at 75 cents. So as of the close of the next session, this guy was up about a quarter of a million bucks. And what did he do with this or she or whoever it was, listeners? Uh, they did nothing. <laughs> That's kind of like my analogy for Vegas. You stay there, you're just going to give it back. This guy ended up giving it back. The stock never really looked back at those levels. That was the apex. That one day after the trade, it pretty much trended right back down again, and it closed at $43 on expiration. And guess what? These calls that he was up a quarter of a million on, they went out worthless. They were still open on expiration. So Mr. Rock Lobster, perhaps a little moral to our tale here of, you know, we talk about all the time, you should do stuff. If you have a hedge on, you should take it off at the opportune time. Certainly on the long premium front on the call side, that also applies. If you have a good move, take it. Get out while the getting's good, at least some of it. Because otherwise, you have this death by a thousand cuts that comes and you know what happens. Mr. Rock Lobster, is that your takeaway from this as well? This guy had a nice little chunk of change and then he lost it all. It would appear like it would appear that just um, I mean, ultimately, calls are made to be sold. I mean, it's rare that you buy a call and the underlying goes up so fast and so far <laughs> that you, you, there's no way you can lose. Uh, a lot of times, you know, especially when volatility is this high, right? You're not. It's very hard for things to just keep trending straight up. I mean, obviously, if you bought all these stocks at the bottom, um but vol wasn't very low either in you know April or March. Don't forget um, when things were at the bottom, vol was pretty high. Uh, so <laughs> to buy a call and make money, um, you had to wait uh, several days just for the stock to make a big enough move as the vol came in. Um, and uh, but on something like this, you know you're 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 looking at a expected move for a period of time according to the straddle. And if you get a pretty good pop, it's like, hey, you just, you know, if you think about it, you just got a move that is already, you know, outside of one standard deviation. That all is going to happen, you know, 30% of the time uh, based on that vol. So you're already like you statistically had a good thing happen, uh, better than better than expected thing happen. So, you know, my sense is you just got to you got to take at least on one one standard deviation would like that, at least 50% of your money off. Um, because calls are just finite things. You know, it's not it's not like you're trying to uh, follow a trend in a, um, in a commodity. Like you think, you know, pork bellies are going up for three straight months, which, which commodities tend to do. Just options, they can die <laughs> because stocks can change their mind, um, especially in a volatile market. And then your options are dead, you know. So it's different than trading futures or, you know, currencies when you have long, longer trends and stuff. So, you know, when things move enough um, and they move fast enough, that's kind of exactly what you want for options. And that's the biggest question I have with my students is like, is it OK to take it off? So and I say, hey, you know, the trade is green. The only thing you trade options for really is a green trade, especially if you're a buyer of options. So as soon as it's green, <clears throat> you're effectively looking to exit. You're just trying to figure out when and what's good enough for you. Um, my general rule is I don't like trades that I've made money on. Once they are no longer green or I'm too close to break even, I just get out of them. Because um, like I screwed up. I didn't take the money when I had a chance. But I don't want to turn something that won into something that's just a total freaking disaster, which is what can happen, um, uh, especially when VIX is 29, right? The market is really uh, squirrely right now. So anyway, I think Mr. Marvell, you know, probably figured that out. Or maybe he had the best time sale of 1.3 million shares of stock ever when the stock blew up. 
That's true. Um, we did we did not look at the stock side of this, so he could have hedged it with stock and go out on a limb and say probably not, but uh, you never know. That's that said, you know, if you case you don't feel like doing the math, listeners, uh, we'll do it for you here. He was up about a quarter of a million after that first day, and when it all was said and done, he lost about three quarters of a million. So it's not just you who's done this. People do this with much larger positions as well. If you get your little pop, you don't have to take all of it off, certainly, but take some. Carve that position down, whittle it down a little bit so you're not facing these enormous catastrophic losses and also just the psychological drain of, man, I had it in my hand and I let it get away, which is almost worse, I think, for some people than losing the actual money. All right, let's go out next up. We're going to go to today again. We're going to set the Wayback Machine to today, see what's lighting it up as we unleash our Eye of Sauron. We're going a little bit farther out this time, actually. Going out to next year in Suncor Energy, ticker symbol SU, trading right now $11.90, up about $0.40. Cents. This is the name that was trading over 30 bucks a year ago, about 30 and a half or so. And then it peaked at about 34 and a half right before the madness. It actually peaked in, looks like in January. Then it started trending down to about 30 and a half by February. And then, of course, it sold off pretty hard down to $9.60. And then it rallied again. And guess when it topped out, listeners? Oh, it topped out on June 8th at 21 and a quarter. And it pretty much has never looked back. This is another one of those names. Where outside of the top five, top ten big names, June 8th was pretty much the high for the rest of the market. Uh, 21 and a quarter is what it hit. And right now it is trading $11.90. So a pale shadow of what it hit back on June 8th. Let's see what our friend found out here, what our Eye of Sauron is looking at. It looks like, Mr. Rocklops, you'll like this. This looks like a pretty sizable line in the sand. Maybe someone's saying, you know what? This thing's taken a beating. It was 30 bucks a year ago. It was 21 bucks a couple of months ago. I don't mind gobbling up this thing for size at uh, the 10 strike. I'm going to put up 23,810 of these puts right off the bid, actually, which is an impressive execution for a pretty decent amount of size. These things were 80 at 95. I think you'd have to crush the bid, maybe go a little bit through it to get all those done. But no, he got them all, all off. Looks like on the Philly... Even though the bid was only for uh, 639, I guess he got a few more actually tighter, which is interesting. Uh, again, these are March of next year, 10 puts for 84 cents. Mr. Rock Lobster, do you A, agree with this, that this is a line in the sand? And then B, if so, what do you think about this particular line, sir? Um, I, I would like to say uh, this is a better line. If it is a line in the sand put, which I'm not saying yet, they're doing a better job than I have with energy stocks this year. <laughs> <laughs> because they're managing to pick this thing up for nothing. That is damning them with faint praise, sir. Yeah, it is damning them with faint praise in a big way. Uh, <laughs> as I look at this, um, you can look at almost energy, any petroleum company, and basically petroleum is a dead business. Like everything's trading under book value. Nobody knows what to value oil in the ground anymore. Um COVID's going to go on forever and nobody's going to drive, start drive to work anymore. Um, even after this, I don't know how many people, you know, if, if you think about it, who wants to get back in a car and commute when you can just work from home uh, on a lot of jobs and only go in like one or two days a week. So I, I see, you know, um, oil volumes coming up, but I, I would think that, you know, some people would just take, hey, this is a much, you know, this could be a much better way of hanging out with your family more stuff like that. Um, so at least short term, I don't think the demand curve looks great for energy. Um, and all of the stocks basically tell you that like the XLE, like below 30, I think it's at a multi-year low, uh, at this point. Um, uh, and Suncor is at a multi-year low as well. Uh, pick, take your pick of energy stocks. So is this a line in the sand and they're going to go, I'm just going to go for it right here. I would have to say just kind of based on sort of how it's trading, yes. Um, it has all the hallmarks of it. Um, I actually like it as a trade. Um, 8% yield till March. You know, and, and you have to think about it too is, you know, is energy going away? And it's if you think about it this way, is energy a growth business anymore? I, I have no idea. Um, um but it does feel like, hey, if you could sell these puts and get an 8% yield, that's not a bad way to go. Um, and I think that's what this person's thinking. 8% till March, what is that, six months? 
So not not an unreasonable return. And if worse comes to worse, you get Suncor uh, somewhere below ten dollars. So I, I I think you're going to see more of these and a lot less call buyers. Um, maybe one of these days, Tucson will talk about the difference between buying calls and selling puts. But I think just the energy sector is much more of a put sale than a call buy at this point. Yeah, um, definitely. I'm with you on this one. I kind of like this one as well. He's getting a lot of juice for you. He sold a 50 vol on the nose, 50 vol even on these. It's a little bit longer time frame than I usually like to play, but it's hard to argue with the rest of it. He's getting a lot of juice for it. Like you said, a pretty decent yield. If he does buy the stock, he's buying almost 2.5 million shares below the 52-week low. I mean, it's kind of hard to argue with any of this. This is a pretty decent one. So we're going to put this in the 2B watch. What are your thoughts here, listeners, on the notion of uh, maybe scooping some Suncor? In this case, this guy is scooping a whole heck of a lot of Suncor at a pretty uh, maybe attractive level. What are your thoughts here as we keep on moving into our final name, getting away from energy, moving on more into uh, the transportation side of the space, in particular, good old UNP, a.k.a. Union Pacific, trading uh, 187 and a quarter right now, off about $12 exactly, or 6%. Not a good day for a UNP. They had earnings before the bell. I'm going to go out on a limb and say the market didn't like what they heard. Uh, let's see. Our, we found Before we talk about what we found, our friends over in Orat's land, they also run their own little scanners out here, and they also highlighted UNP. They're talking, uh, they're, it's number six on their list today in terms of about two and a half times their volume versus their normal average. So as of they did this report, it was about 13,100 contracts versus about 5,900 uh, as their average. And of course, what highlighted our tape, what our eye of Sauron found was a nice round, even 10,000 line. You don't often see that, but in this case, Nice round, even 10,000. Usually one or two ticks in there because something's in the book or maybe some other small lots get tacked on. But nope, 10,000 even of the Nove 175 puts. By the way, really quickly, UNP a year ago was trading 170, 77. Got as high as about 210. Uh, Looks like that wasn't before the sell-off, though. It was still about 181 before the big sell-off in February. Then it sold off to 105. And then it rallied back right, right again, got up to about 184 and change right around June 8th. And then it sold off again and hovered down there for a while, 165 and change, until recently when it kind of surged back up north of it. And it recently hit about 210, almost 211, just about a week ago. That was the high for the year. And then it's now obviously sold off quite a bit since then. So the market taking some of those profits back. Looks like maybe someone also perhaps drawing a pretty sizable line in the sand here in UNP as well, this time to the tune of a cool 1 million shares, a.k.a. 10,000 contracts, of the Nove 175 puts, so about $12 and change out of the money puts, going up for $2.31, as the Irish like to say. That's a 36 and a half vol, if you're wondering out there. The stock was at 189 and a half when he put this up, so a couple of points north of where it is right now. Mr. Rock Lobster, A, do you agree that these are lying the sand puts as well? And B... Do you like these ones, sir? These 175 puts in Union Pacific. Um, who, who is getting? Who is giving your vault tags now? I feel like there's a slight uptick in the uh, in the odd block. Like more more information to the to the to the listeners. We like to turn it up for the folks out there. You know, we're good like that. We we give them even more free information. They weren't getting enough before for free. Now they're getting more. <laughs> well, I, you know what's funny is I guess why are the rails? Are, I guess the rails deliver a lot of stuff for Amazon. <laughs> I, I guess right because they're not delivering oil. So why the heck are um, why the heck are all the transports at all time highs? I guess because energy is going to be cheap for the foreseeable future, right? I mean, you, you have to think about that. So we, I think all these stocks are up, what, almost 100% from the bottom. I mean, you look at FedEx, is up almost 100% since July, I think. Um, so um, do I like this? Um, you know, from a yield point of view, it's, 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 a, it's a 1% per month or a little, maybe a little better than that. Um, it is, I think this is a little touchier um, as far as that goes, but I don't think it's, it's a bad trade. Um, um, again, I, I don't think it's a bad trade if somebody wants to purchase UNP. You're like, hey, I don't want to buy the stock now, but I'll buy it later. I would have to like a wimpy trade. This isn't quite line in the sand, more like a wimpy trade. I will gladly pay you in November for UNP at 175 And in the meantime, I will take $2.30. So 
if you think about selling puts in that way where you have kind of a clear path on what you want to do, it keeps you from, you know, um, getting run over. So I, this is what I would call not quite line in the sand um, just because it's not tagging that kind of multi-year low of a strike. I think this is just somebody looking at um, the earnings. There's some juice there. And they will take that. And, you know, and most likely they'll be closing this after the election for not very much money. Uh, as far as, you know, I think they'll get those. These puts will get thrashed. So that's where uh, this one is. So not quite a line in the sand, but something something in between. I don't know if we can call it the wimpy trade, uh, <laughs> but it's something because it's not wimpy. You know, you're selling some puts on one hundred seventy five dollar stock. But it's like trying to get something today that you will pay for in the future. I'll gladly pay you Tuesday for some Union Pacific puts uh, today, at least to sell them. <laughs> What'd you rather get? Two dollars and thirty-one cents in a hundred and seventy-five dollar strike, or eighty-four cents in a ten-dollar stock? Uh, I'll leave it up to you to decide. Obviously, different time frames in there, but still interesting. I'm not. You're right. I'm with you. I'm not as excited about this one. Doesn't it get me as jazzed up? But we'll see. Maybe you guys like it. Maybe you guys like uh, the Rock Lobsters Wimpy Trade. Now it's time to see what you guys really like because it is time for the mail block. It's time to take your seat on the all-star panel as we read your emails, tweets, Facebook messages, website comments, and much more. It's time for The Mail Block. All right, everybody. Let's see what we got here. Lots of you guys on the docket today. First up, Daily Investor. Sounds like they were listening to our last show. The one we did with uh, Mr. Rhodes talking about VolQ and VIX and all that fun stuff. And he said, or perhaps she, they said, electric light bulb moment. Uh, The volatility index, a.k.a. VIX, is a real-time market index that measures the market's expectation of volatility of 30 days based on the price inputs of the S&P 500 index options. Well, yes. Short answer, yes. (laughs) Longer answer, glad we could give you that light bulb moment out there of what VIX is. Uh, I'm guessing you're new to the shows, <laughs> but either way, welcome there, daily investors. And yes, that's pretty much what, what VIX is in a nutshell. Enjoy that volatility light bulb moment. May you have many more of them. All right, next up, Mackenzie. Uncle Mike, this is up your alley. Mackenzie says, I think the wheel strategy is the most profitable option strategy on the planet. Fight me on it! <laughs> Exclamation point. <laughs> Mackenzie's looking for a fight. I don't know if you're going to get one here, Mackenzie. We were all pretty much big fans of the wheel trade here, or as the unclest of Mike refers to it, the triple income strategy. Mr. Uncle Mike, since this is very much in your wheelhouse, uh, what do you have to say for Mackenzie? Are you going to fight uh, he or she on this? I would never fight any of our listeners. Um, I would say that it's profitable if it works. I mean, obviously, if you were to buy a call on Tesla – Earlier in the year this year, that would have been more profitable than pretty much anything. Uh, but uh, in terms of the profitability of the strategy, uh, I'm very fond of it. I'll say that uh, in that uh, we put a lot of we put a lot into our triple income portfolio at uh, RCM. We really like it a lot. Uh, but uh, to say it's the most profitable or the only thing, I don't know if I'd go that far. I think that there's other aspects of option trading that are very important as well. But uh, I'm definitely a huge fan. Not going to deny that. And uh, if anyone wants to fight you on that, Mackenzie, let me know. I am in your corner. Uncle Mike will probably fight alongside you, not against you there, Mackenzie. Right, since we got you on, Mr. Uncle Mike, uh, we had an interesting conversation yesterday on good old Options Boot Camp. Check it out. I know a lot of you probably already have. You folks love Options Boot Camp these days. One of our regular listeners on there buys you. <laughs> he asked a question for that show. Uncle Mike, you're not going to be on that show probably again for a while. So I thought I would cheat and bring it up here. Baiju asked, uh, he said, hi, Mark and Mike. Great episode on OBC episode 109. I had to hear it twice because it was so interesting. <laughs> well, thank you for that, Baiju. Uh, he says, hearing your thoughts. The main takeaway was do not over leverage. Take, take marked positions. I'm not sure what he was, was, uh, what he was referring to there. Always cover and have a target roll slash exit idea. Yeah, that's pretty much it there, Baiju. He says, thank you. Now, my question for this week is, do you ever look at initial margin efficiency study of some form to see whether to hedge using options or futures? Understand it is usually done in combination, but do traders run any study to see how much capital they need to allocate in each of the instrument types 
to better make use of capital. My understanding is the at the money long option premium paid can be less than the future initial margin. So if this is the starting point, then do you prefer one over the other? Thanks. So I thought he had a question about how we hedged and rolled puts yesterday. I guess he doesn't. He has a question about more of futures, which I guess we can also get into on Twifo. But Uncle Mike, uh, since we're talking about it here, any thoughts here for Baiju and his question about initial margin efficiency, sir? Uh, yeah, I do, actually, Baiju. Um, I just happened to get someone... Um, a couple of weeks ago who has a very high dollar portfolio well into the eight figures and he's very concerned about the election. And so what we discussed was he, he basically wants to not be worried on election night in case the, the markets go down 10, 20, 30 percent or whatever, which is very possible. No one's going to argue with that. And so we went through the different scenarios of whether we could use short futures or whether we could use options. <coughs> Excuse me. We ultimately went with options because what we decided was that he's not looking to get a tick for tick hedge on things. He's looking to get something to where if the market goes higher, he loses 100% of his investment with me. He's totally fine with that. And believe me, I had to get a lot of paperwork to get that one through compliance. But uh, uh, it's kind of one to where he understands that he just wants insurance. And so the reason we went that route was that if we do have a big move to the upside, the futures are going to hold him back. And that the futures are going to be something to where you're essentially just selling the stock by doing that. Now, nothing against that. I know people who hedge with futures all the time. But in this gentleman's instance, options worked out way better because of the fact that uh, just the long and short of it, we, we just uh, bought a bunch of out of the money SPX puts. I mean, there's a, little, a lot more a lot more to it than that. But that's basically what we did. And we're doing it from the standpoint of a hedge for insurance. And if we have a major market meltdown come election night, then he's going to be cashing in those puts the next day. Uh, but if we don't and the markets go higher or they don't go down that much, he's fine with that. So I think it's important to look at both of them in whatever you're doing. Well said, sir. Mr. Rocklops, anything to add here for uh, Baiju and his question about initial margin efficiency on using options or futures, sir? It, it almost is like, doesn't it feel like this could be an endless topic for like multiple, multiple shows? Yeah, it could go on. We'll probably talk about it on Twifo down the road, too, because it gets into what we talk about there as well. Uh, I mean, I actually have one of my uh, a couple students that, that moved to futures just because they do like the efficiency. Um, but they also realize that I think part of that efficiency comes with a, um, you know, you're, you're only have to put up 10 or 20 percent of capital. Which, you know, if the market's a little squirrely, you could be stopped out or you have a margin requirement. So, I mean, ultimately, you know, if you're trading futures, you're kind of you have to uh, let's just say you have to be able to manage the position if it starts to get a little bit woolly for your margin um, options. I just assume uh, if I sell options, I'm going to get assigned. That's the easiest way I can think about it. If you want to reduce that risk, you create a spread. Um, that's the easiest way I can think to tell somebody to look at, you know, how to be efficient using your money with options. Uh, I rarely sell naked puts. Like in this case, the Suncor, I probably would sell a naked put. I would sell spread. But in stocks over $100, I tend to sell spreads. I'll go for the little extra just to give me the extra kick by having that long put. And I could sell out that long put wherever I want if I feel like I need to, you know, buy the bottom or, you know, just give my give myself at least one uh, one thing to manage sort of on the put on the trade. So you're you're you you have to look at one how you can manage your position and and what mentally you can handle, because uh, what I found is, you know, even though you're, you're OK with what we'll call the initial maintenance margin. Mentally, you might not be okay with where it ends up if things go wrong. Um, and I would say you have to do a little checking in with yourself on that. Well said, sirs, both of you there. Well done. Unfortunately, spent so much time answering your questions and gassing on about massive line in the sand puts and everything else like that. They were kind of coming up against it. But don't worry, listeners. If you need more in your ear holes, we're here for you. You know we got you back here on the old Options Insider Radio Network. You know, a double dose of content. 
coming at you today in a little bit. You're going to get Twifo coming live in your air holes in between. If you're listening live, you get some fun stuff, maybe some boot camp. Maybe that episode we just talked about, maybe some OPR, maybe some other fun stuff in between. We'll be back in a little bit. Before we go, let's go back around the horn. Let's do a combo around the block as well as what you guys have that may interest our listeners. Let's start with your uncle, so Mike, sir. What are you watching for the rest of this week into the weekend? A... And B, if folks are intrigued, maybe they have questions like Baiju, they want to reach out. Where should they go? What should they do? Well, I'm watching the debates. I think that's the next thing that we need to watch. And then tomorrow, what am I watching? I'll see what I want to watch after the debates tonight. I think that's going to be the big thing. Uh, very excited to watch on my phone uh, the futures as the, bait, the debates are going. I think it's going to be really a big thing. And uh, this has the potential of being a pretty major market mover, in my opinion. So I'm watching that. If you would like more information in terms of where you can go, what you can do to learn more about what I do, I'm a financial advisor. I'm not afraid of the option trading product. Almost all my clients have options in some way, shape, or form in their portfolio. Feel free to go to my website at stcharleswealth.com, and you can find my contact information there. Uh, That is all, and have a great weekend, everybody. So long. There you go. Find them. Click on the fabulous fox for fun and prizes. One day that will do stuff. Over there at stcharleswealth.com. You keep clicking, listeners. One day we'll make it happen. And Mr. Rock Lobster, what are you watching for the rest of this week into the weekend? A and B, if folks are want to reach out, they want to kick the tires on a little John or perhaps the forthcoming Friar Tuck or anything else you guys have cooking over there, where should they go? What should they do? Go to optionpit.com, go to our memberships page, and check out all of our goodies. Um, if you want a wrap of maybe several products at once, you can certainly, uh, I'll be happy to talk to you about it. Andrew at OptionPit.com, and put some of your option trading and learning on. Put your learning on, indeed. OptionPit.com is the place to go. And on behalf of the unclest of mics and the rockingest of lobsters, and indeed myself, what did we decide on the other day? Oh, the the options overlord. (laughs) The overlordiest of options. I want to thank all of you guys out there for downloading, streaming, subscribing, for sending in such great questions. Keep them coming. Of course, if you're listening live, stay tuned. We'll be back in a little bit. Got uh, our old boy Dan Gramza joining us again on Twifo. He's got a pretty interesting election trade he was telling me about. He says, stay tuned for this one. should be kind of interesting. So stay tuned for that and a whole bunch more. Otherwise, we'll see you back here tomorrow, noon central, 1 p.m. Eastern, for the old Vol Views. And then it all kicks off again on Monday with another episode of The Option Block. You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network, the home of the Options Podcast. For more quality options programs, visit theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app available on the iTunes and Google Play stores. Select programs are also available via live stream at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com slash options dash insider. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at Twitter.com slash options, StockTwits.com slash options, Facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the options insider.com.